So, uh, good morning, good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, and wherever you are, because in this uh, new world after, after the pandemic. So, my name is uh, Carlos Lopez, and I'm together with uh, Mohamed Adnan. Uh, we are chairing this uh, webinar from the React Technical Committee. So, it's for us a, a pleasure to, to chair this session today. So we are going to start, first of all, with a very short presentation, just to introduce to, to you, which is uh, what is React, who we are, what we do, and also if you want to connect to us, what, uh, how you can connect to us, okay? So let me, let me just go to brief presentation about what is React. So you see my screen. So REACT is basically the acronym of Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Technologies. So basically, we are a group of people, uh, a technical committee, uh, it is the administrative form, and we belong to the Geoscience of Remote uh, Sensing Society from the And we are a group of people just chairing and um, driving this, this technical committee. So which are, are what we do we do in, in this technical committee? So as you know, I mean, uh, today we have many uh, societal challenges. I mean, climate change, environment, uh, resource management, uh, sustainable development, also uh, mega cities, mobility, hazards, disasters, uh, all of them related with the, with the climate change. And in all these uh, societal challenges, Remote sensing may play a key role on monitoring and on uh, obtaining information about these uh, different channels. So the, the idea of React, our motivation, our objective as a technical committee is to be, as stated in this slide, is a venue for scientists and engineers and people working in the domain uh, of climate change also, uh, people working on remote sensing and how remote sensing can contribute to this to this challenge, just to exchange ideas, to share the knowledge among us, to drive new activities in which GRSS could contribute on, on the domain of or on the fusion of remote sensing and or and climate change. And also the aim is to advance science, defining requirements for different uh, missions for different concepts, for different algorithms, et cetera, in all the domains of the, of, of the air, cryosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere. So basically, this is how do we um, divide ourselves today? How do we uh, structure basically our, uh, our domain? So the different working, small working groups of React deal with different uh, areas of interest. In here, uh, we have four. We have uh, uh, how climate change may affect uh, Pacific Islands, how uh, uh, climate change may affect also agriculture and food security in China, how floods and water security are affected in Africa, and finally, uh, how the Indo Cruz Caracol and Malaya is affected by, by climate change. Here you can see the different responsibles. But what we do is basically to provide the forum to drive activities into this domain. Mm -hmm. So for all of you who are interested in contributing or into collaborating to, to this uh, technical uh, committee, I will invite you to go to the GRSS website where you have the website of the React, and there you can have much more information than the, the one we can provide here in these presentations. So that's all I, what I wanted to say about this, uh, this React, and without further delay, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Hamad Jilani, who will be our uh, host today. Uh, he belongs to the International Water Management Institute in Pakistan. Uh, he will present a presentation on uh, Pakistan coastal ecosystems in, uh, mapping and monitoring. So if you have questions about the presentation about uh, Dr. Jinani, I would recommend to wait until the end, or you can put the questions of the Q&A mm -hmm. uh, place into the, into the Zoom or into the chat, okay? 
So without further delay, uh, Dr. Zilani, the floor is yours. You are muted, Dr. Gilani. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Um, now I think my slide is up in a slide more. Everything Am is I perfect. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, everything thank is so perfect. Much. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, let me um, express my gratitude as well as a special thanks um, providing me this opportunity uh, particularly those who are researchers, as Carlos mentioned about in working in different areas. And particularly, um, I am very much thankful to um, REACT giving me this opportunity to showcase um, a case study um, from Pakistan side. And because uh, Pakistan is uh, one of the country, if you see um, in the coming slide, you will see. Okay, so here you see um, the. This is the overall uh, map of Pakistan. So it has diverse uh, landscape, a very high altitude to the uh, coastal um, belt and the sea, and in between, uh, hill, hills are there, plain areas are there, and we. As a, as a country, we are facing a number of challenges. We, we have uh, frequently droughts, floods, uh, fly floods, uh, hill torrent floods, and even heat uh, um, and sometimes landslides, and so many, name it, in terms of the climate change and in terms of um, particularly talking about the coastal ecosystem. So most of the time uh, we, we neglect because it's area point of view, very small area covers, but if you see Pakistan coastal ecosystem point of view, um, it is this the red line shows you the coastal uh, coastal line of Pakistan. So if it start from the um, eastern side in India and the western side is Iran. So in it is stretch is um, around 1050 kilometer as in terms of the land and the in terms of the weight 40 to 50 kilometer it is an in between number of uh, areas are the hotspot areas or uh, hotspot when i say it means in terms of the ramsar side in terms of the some areas where uh, migratory birds are coming frequently visiting pakistan in coastal area and uh, in terms of the cyclone we have we, we have to uh, prepare our community for the societal benefit we need to work so the, these areas are most of the time neglected so these small dots, if you see on the map from one to eight, these are the areas where mangrove exists in Pakistan. So when I say uh, the coastal ecosystem, uh, large number of e this entire ecosystem consists on number of things like mangroves, uh, coral, and even some areas are the fish, different type of in terms of the water quality, in terms of the soil characteristic, name it. But Today, I am going to focus mostly on the uh, mangrove one because this, this is the uh, one of the incoming slides you will see my research motivation how I started thinking about this work and uh, contributed using the geospatial remote sensing data set. So these are the air sites. Let me clarify one uh, thing here. If you go through literature, you will find uh, the five mangrove sites uh, in Pakistan. So, uh, but again, I, again, for me, when I started research in this area, I was also thinking the five sides and I work on the five side. But later on, when I connected with some people, they, they discover and they explore to me, uh, we have three more sites. So in that sense, using the geospatial data, what we did, we identify these three sites or which these sites are, let me tell you. Fifth number, the Shadi core, 
Sarkor and JB and Ankara. These sites actually uh, are the newly emerging sites. Um, in 2005, first time mangroves were planted in these three sites um, and uh, observed uh, in terms of the growth. And at the moment, we can clearly see very, very small contributions, but we can see the potential exists there. And a biodiversity point of view, these are some of the areas where we can invest in terms of the conservation, in terms of the protection, in terms of the introducing the uh, new species. And at the moment, uh, we, 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 we work on these um, eight sites. So uh, throughout the presentation, I, I will try to emphasize a few of the policy side as well as some of the geospatial remote sensing prospective sites, how uh, these two are linked with each other and, and we can communicate to the community, to the policy maker, the CN maker, as well as researcher, the scientist in our community. Um, going through uh, in terms of the research or motivation, uh, mangrove plantation from uh, this this is this was uh, in couple of years back uh, when I was away um, and I was thinking I was not working on a mangrove. I, I was always looking and was fascinating in terms of um, what is happening on the ground. Um, if you see uh, since uh, 2006 onward till date, a number of activities on the grounds are going on in terms of the plantation, in terms of the conservation, in terms of the developing. Uh, um, nurseries, uh, seed collections, and uh, inviting uh, foreign um, some of the guests and internally mobilization of the community to to actually uh, to conserve the uh, forest. One thing is that, and the second side is to plant more and more uh, mangroves. So in two thousand nine. The uh, Guinness uh, Book of World Record, um, Pakistan was nominated uh, because of the plantation. So this 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 was the one of the my uh, motivation. So actually, I will state uh, um, again my motivation point of view in 2006 and 2008 in the coastal area, and I actually work in that area, collected field data, and that time was uh, limited uh, ground data. I visited Keti Bandar as well as uh, so uh, Somiani uh, and uh, Kalmatkor and Jivani area sites. So these are the some of the areas I visited, but. Most importantly, in terms of the research point of view, this was the, from the field point of view, if I understand, um, we, we collect some of the information, we consolidate information, but most of the time it happens, we we don't communicate to the um, to the uh, outer audience. So this is the one of the platform where I am presenting to the uh, outer audience from the outside of the Pakistan, as well as inside those who are interested in this one. So if I actually, I started this work in uh, 2000, um, uh, 2020. Uh, 2020 was the time uh, uh, of uh, COVID. So I consolidated all the literature and in the literature, what I found, except one or two research articles, rest were um, only the re reports or the uh, websites were exist information and some of the different organization work in these lines, but there was no research article on in terms of the mangrove, what is how the it, mangroves are increasing or decreasing, which are the areas are the potential areas where we can grow or which of the areas are plantation, what is happening in terms of the plantation and uh, in terms of the conservation. So these were the few questions I actually wrote in terms of the covering very simple, very basic question, mangrove cover change assessment. Can we do? Yes, we can do. As we are living in an era where we have uh, open access satellite data, we have open access uh, cloud computing platforms, we have uh, the resources, different algorithm, uh, either talk about the machine learning, uh, statistical, geostatistical, so many techniques exist in, in era if we've where we actually share our information. So in this era, even we need to consolidate the information and to communicate the information. So that is the thing, one thing. That was the, my motivation. So if this is a very simple uh, flowchart diagram, if you can quickly 
uh, give me you okay so here is the point so you can you can see i actually i collected 1990 from 1990 to 2020 at the five year interval land side satellite images computing some indices and based on these uh, indices as well as spectral responses um uh, just to using a simple machine learning algorithm, random forest, um, uh, calculated the or the map the uh, mangrove cover. So this this was a very basic thing. So apart from that one, uh, using the landscape metric analysis, forest fragmentation, I have done. So if you are more interested in terms of understanding and to methodology point of view, in terms of the result, in terms of the different threads. Although at the moment we we have very limited threads and that those are again very very uh, local scale. So in terms of the larger scale, in terms of the national scale, uh, what is happening? What in terms of the cover? Yes, this is true picture. We are increasing our mangroves. 1990s is and the number was 477 at the moment it is around 1064 uh, kilometers square so this this is the thing this this was for me even shocking when i was preparing my manuscript i was working with the data set i was shocked is it true and it was because of the plantation one thing is obvious thing um it is acceptable but for the scientific community, I need to get some evidence. Those evidence from the satellite images as well as from the ground repeat photography. So here, if you see, uh, these are two uh, pairs. So here I have actually um, uh, one of um, uh, the uh, organization, WWF, you may know, in Pakistan are continuously um, capturing uh, these areas and uh, they have very good um, uh, resource in terms of the repeat photography and they are doing continuously here you can see uh, for the transparency point of view for the audience who actually uh, are, could be think like that one uh, how it, this is happening on the ground so we can see in terms of the time series uh, satellite data as well as in terms of the time series uh, you can say repeat photographs so we can clearly see uh, from the barren land to the lush green mangrove very dense canopy is that one so in this is the evidence so i actually i communicated and this is the one of the area so this is the one of the results accepted at the global level internally as well as yes uh, published in a uh, number of newspaper but in 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 one of the report blue carbon rapid assessment um, that was published um, uh, under the world bank and presented um, at that time former uh, prime minister so actually that uh, that report and the book is available so you can go through and can see the result what i have uh, shown you are part of that one. So this is the one contribution in terms of the policy. So uh, this is the biggest claim in terms of how the remote sensing geospatial data can contribute to the um, policy in terms of um, one is the uh, defining in terms of the uh, protected forest uh, in Blochistan. Blochistan is one of the province where we have a very small um, mangrove sites. Uh, these are the six mangrove sites. So recently, uh, government of Blochistan, based on our results, you can see the, this map and this map in the notification, the same maps are used. So similar uh, same maps actually used in all the six sites mangroves are protected so now they have declared officially so this is the one contribution in terms of the policy uh, th these results are widely accepted uh, widely being used in different platform uh, this is the uh, one area um, I, I can I, I show you so uh, this was a one part but from another part is how we can use a, a long-term geospatial data to understand the anomaly. Anomaly in terms of the, when we, when we say anomaly means behavior of a particular um, pixel from normal behavior to abnormal behavior, either positive side or the negative side. So uh, using the, again, um, simple NDVI normalized difference validation index, we can see um, the uh, anomalies and we can see in terms of this uh, 
graph a positive side um, of uh, pixels and positive green ring side. So this is the one of the area. So in terms of this is the, again, evidence point of view using the geospatial data, we can use its techniques in any of the uh, sites and we can assess that one. So this is again, uh, widely uh, being used at different platform. So up to here, I actually, I work on a only using the satellite data, remote sensing data, uh, using the cloud computing technology. But missing gap information is the ground information. The, when I say ground information, and ground information means that the information we can collect to, to come out different um, parameters in terms of the carbon stock, in terms of the tree height, uh, in terms of the quality, in terms of the uh, soil carbon stock, name it. So uh, di di different people are using for different objectives, these ground data. So uh, just before the COVID uh, week, actually between 14 to 18, uh, 28 Feb 2020, we actually collected um, 53 samples only in interest data. We we have some of the uh, field data for other sites um, like Somiani, Kalmatkur, and in uh, Jivani, but uh, those are not analyzed. So I am only going to present at the moment uh, the, on Indus Delta. So um, at Indus Delta uh, field data we collected um, in 2020. So you can see uh, these young boys and with the field staff, uh, we, we, we were able to go in a dense a mangrove area, collected field data. So uh, this no, uh, no, uh, upper part of the where my cursor is um, making some circle. So here we have the dense mangrove, but these are uh, the very close to the, just in front of the mouth of the sea, Arabian Sea. Uh, these are the young mangroves. So uh, because of the, I know the plantation, so we we actually collected from the very dense to the um, uh, young uh, forest. Uh, we could not make in uh, this area because of the uh, pandemic started, as well as some of the areas um, are far far from uh, our reach. Uh, and we we have we we had that time considered of the financial resources. So, but we could manage in these areas and. Most importantly, at the moment, you can see the salinity also exists in this one. So in that, this is the one of the another thread in an area um, because of the fresh water is not reaching up to this point. So in th these are the areas need to be uh, uh, explored. And let me tell you uh, the dynamic of this and in terms of the characteristic of this uh, Indus Delta. Indus Delta is actually the um, fifth largest Delta seventh largest mangrove forest exists in this and the largest arid mangrove uh, site in the world. So this is the very unique characteristic of Indus Delta. So if you uh, go into this one, it has the area of 8,000 square kilometer. It's a huge area. Uh, so in terms of the cloud computing technology, we uh, we use and we have done some of the analysis in terms of the soil organic carbon uh, mapping, as well as using the um, satellite based uh, LIDAR data for the tree height mapping and the uh, above ground biomass density mapping. So I, I will go further into this one uh, in the coming slide. So if you, um, once we collected this field data, so first objective was to analyze in a field. So um, one of my students actually um, dedicated his uh, intensive time in a field uh, as well as in the in the, in a lab to analyze the field data. So it, here I have the methodology, and I can uh, share um, the if um, the slides, and you can go to the the uh, Google Drive and can uh, see the high resolution and. Um, the flowchart diagram of this one. But let me tell you um, quickly, uh, in this uh, methodology, what we did, we we collected one side field data, another side we have the Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and integration of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, integration of uh, these two um, sensor and uh, come out uh, which one is performing uh, better by keeping uh, the training data and validation data uh, 
same so in uh, this um, uh, particular uh, method we used a random forest machine learning algorithm uh, based on the literature review we we found that is um, widely used as well as giving us better result so uh, here actually uh, this side you can see the overall uh, methodology uh, overall methodology but other side uh, we this is a detailed uh, methodology of laboratory work analysis in in the lab and how we have analyzed the, um, the field data um, in terms of the soil carbon uh, mapping uh, so sorry soil carbon um, assessment so here we we you can see the initial result um, soil surface 0.1 meter and subsoil surface is 0.5 meter so uh, we can see in clearly um, the difference between the surface and the subsurface uh, uh, soil organic carbon and here again we have the outlayer in uh, soil subsurface uh, data so uh, for the mapping point of view as uh, we we know um, the penetration power of the sentinel one and the uh, sentinel two is again the reflectance data combination of these um, collection and uh, we only uh, concentrated on um, we, we work only on the surface data we didn't work on the subsurface side so um, keeping in mind um, the field data collected in 2020 in february and similarly we actually for the synchronization point of view uh, we use the february 2020 images for sentinel one and sentinel two so initially we use the machine learning algorithm uh, random forest as i mentioned so one of the biggest challenge when we work on the machine learning algorithms uh, so hyper parameter tuning so here what we did we 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 done experiments uh, uh, changing the number of trees because that is the major hyper parameter we actually use so we actually uh, came out in in terms of the which one is better for the sentinel 1 sentinel 2 and the integration of sentinel one and sentinel two you can see here so using these parameters we we came out um in terms of the validation and just yes, obviously at the moment we we are not able to publish this one uh, it is going to be published but initially what we found and um this, this which one is performing better so in terms of the integration we found it is performing much better as compared to only sentinel one and sentinel two when we integrate these two uh, data set to two sensor so here we have the result um, you can clearly see in uh, this particular uh, the graph um, uh, sentinel one we we have a kind of overestimation and in terms of the uh, sentinel two it is again is uh, covering this this um, initial portion of the carbon stock and that is but it is uh, leaving out the uh, higher biomass values so but only integration is the one actually um, performing better than um, since uh, sensors of sentinel one and sentinel two um, so it means that one find one of the finding is we need to integrate uh, this uh, satellite data set sensors and different parameters um, uh, linking with the field information to come out the um, more accurate carbon stock mapping uh, either the above or the uh, soil one. So uh, here, a um, uh, quick uh, comparison um, between our finding as well as the with other um, globally published uh, data sets. So you can see um, here, um, our findings are very close to the Orissa India sites. So most of the time, uh, again, it is very much dependent on the um, in depth in terms of the uh, number of uh, data collected um, in terms of the uh, algorithms in terms of the training um, uh, of the algorithm uh, different uh, methods uh, fields uh, um, in terms of the geographical area of the site so all these factors we actually consider so what we found is um, uh, at the moment uh, this experiment went very well and we are in a phase uh, to publish this uh, work so uh, this this is in terms of the soil organ carbon in terms of the uh, above ground biomass and that canopy tree height mapping point of view now these days a lot of people are talking and working on the jedi jedi is a global ecosystem dynamic investigation this is um, one of the um, lidar satellite based lidar system so actually it 
uh, it has a very uh, characteristics in terms of the different uh, it provides a level so you can see uh, the level two is uh, providing the foot uh, print level canopy height profile matrix and the level four is um, the gridded above ground biomass and level three and level uh, one are actually level one is the raw data and level two is again gridded canopy height data so in this case uh, what we did um, we actually uh, use um, the level two data as well as um, uh, level two data because we, we want to use the uh, uh, foot brink uh, canopy height information so we want to develop our own data so only what we have observed in in the develop the canopy height maps um, some areas are completely missing some areas are overestimations is going on uh, particularly in terms of the mangroves um, uh, underestimation is going on um, even in terms uh, in terms of the mangrove cover we have um, observed um, globally available uh, data sets are not accurately mapping uh, the mangroves because of the tide heights because of the uh, locally uh, changing environment so in that sense uh, we actually use um, level two data and our own uh, field information um, we consolidated these two information integrated into the machine learning algorithm that is again we use random forest we came out a uh, wall-to-wall above ground biomass density map as well as the um, tree height mapping so let me show you uh, some of the um, quick findings canopy height point of view uh, we actually um, use um, a method in terms of the grid search CV and Bruta algorithm uh, to identify which um, of the parameters are and the variables are performing better. So in terms of the observed height as well as uh, in terms of the remote sensing indices. So uh, what we observe and um, you can see here clearly few of the parameters are um, playing important role in this one. So we use the, those parameters and uh, in, ter in terms of the machine learning algorithm, we uh, came out the results of the wall-to-wall did I R H ninety eight canopy height map uh, for the um, for the mangrove in the Indus Delta region. So we validated this one, and what we observe is um, R square value is point uh, six six, and root mean square is point five a meter. So in that sense, still we we need to um, think about um, where we are standing in terms of the size scientific um, comparison point yes we have the literature that is again I was um, thinking to uh, to come out as a research articles and then publish and then accordingly make available this uh, data set so this is the one of the result based on the uh, methodology we uh, constructed here and again for the uh, using the canopy height and uh, above ground biomass density what we actually done we actually use observe above ground biomass density linking with the remote sensing indices um, what we have done uh, at the moment unfortunately we don't have at the moment the, the um, locally developed allometric green for the above ground biomass calculation so what we did we use the uh, globally available uh, in the allometric equation so one of the drawback is this one we understand so if we have the locally developed um, allometric equation um, we could use and then uh, could be um, we can have a precise above ground biomass so in that sense again um, the root mean square is 1.1779 and um, at the moment R square value is 0.56 and this is validated one above ground by a month and uh, we we what we have observed in terms of the globally um, we uh, we are coming out and a closer um, uh, closer to the um, ground information so but need to communicate need to um, inform uh, local decision makers because at the moment uh, debate is going on in terms of the carbon crediting uh, in terms of the uh, under the red mechanism uh, for MRV monitoring reporting and verification remote sensing is the key instrument and in providing the information so this is the one of the transparent information which we are providing we are we are trying to actually consolidate information and and to communicating the uh, local authorities as well as scientific research community. So I stop here. Um, unfortunately, um, or you can say intentionally even, I don't have a concluding slide. Because what I think is, 
at the moment, whatever we have, um, either in terms of the satellite data, either in terms of the field data, are linking uh, these two data sets um, uh, through any platform, any algorithm, we may get some different results, some different innovation findings, uh, some of the interesting things. So that's why this is the talk actually i presented what i have done with the collaboration of different um, agencies different um, my partner and particularly with my students um, so i uh, with this i acknowledge uh, particularly one of sindh and the balochistan forest department uh, wwf pakistan um, the um, arid agricultural university uh, particularly because they actually in their lab um, um, um we actually uh, done analysis um field data for the soil carbon carbon and uh, most of the work actually um i work uh, during the time uh, when i was associated um uh, with uh, Institute of Space Technology, I especially acknowledge them. And uh, with this, I also acknowledge my students um, who, who are very closely and um, working in uh, on these areas and these uh, ex exploring these um, these research questions. So I stop here. Uh, I know uh, we may get a lot of questions and I'm happy uh, to answer. Thank you so much. OK. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Professor, Professor Gilani, for this very nice presentation and this uh, clear example on, on, on how remote sensing can contribute to the monitoring of local areas and the anti-day mangroves. So now we have uh, time for uh, several qu for questions. So uh, even you can uh, unmute yourself and you can ask a question to Professor uh Gilani, or you can put your questions into the q a or or in the chat because uh, uh there are already several questions okay so if if i may i will read the questions from the from the from the chat so we have a uh the first question from uh, ali Agbas bahid that basically you already answer more or less that question, but he's basically uh, uh, or stating uh, if you could fuse Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2, and this is what you have shown in the, in the, in the presentation, so if you could get more, more details about this data fusion, and also I was surprised that uh, when you use Sentinel-1 alone, you get some issue, issues, some problems with the estimation, if you could uh, uh, tell us why Sentinel was alone was so problematic. So please. Okay. Um, first, um, in terms of the data fusion um, or integration, um, what we have observed uh, when we were working um, in uh, using only the uh, Sentinel-2. So first, our experiment uh, was um, uh, using only the uh, Sentinel-2, and we we are ex we were thinking always uh, because we are working on Earth, um, and uh, reflectance is the most um, most suitable uh, for in terms of the linking the ground information because uh, that is one of the understanding but in terms of the um, sentinel 2 uh, what we have observed um, some of the information we are missing because of the uh, mangroves actually when we talk about uh, soil organic carbon are the above ground biomass let me give you the example of soil organic carbon soil is actually um, we actually collected the data above the, uh, below the mangroves. So actually it is the beneath the mangroves. So that means mm -hmm. that we need to penetrate in certain uh, meters where we can actually get the sense of the soil. So that is one thing. So th that's why we need to integrate the uh, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. Uh, let me give you the example of above ground biomass. When we say above ground biomass, actually for uh, from above, we actually seeing only the uh, canopy. But if you theoretically see the carbon exists in a diameter, diameter at best height. So Actually, we should 
uh, we should again see in terms of the penetration what is happening you know, under the uh, canopy. So in that sense, it is obviously uh, we should integrate. We try to when we whenever we are wherever we need to. Like actually, uh, I recent time if you see the ELOS is again available. Pulsar data is available. So that is. Uh, almost uh, at par of the uh, lens that we can integrate so that we can get the result. And we have done some one experiment in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region where we have a canopy of um, hilly area. So mm -hmm. for the above ground by muscle. And that time we also observed that integration of a loss and the uh, uh, lens set and even optical giving us the good result. So obviously integration um, always give us good result and particularly uh, it is not in integration of the satellite data. It is always about the calculating different indices and integration. So indices, again, whenever any uh, kind of fluctuation in terms of the saturation exists in terms of the signal, so we actually could capture in slight change. Like that's why the hyperspectral is one of the good examples. As your example is in terms of the Sentinel-1 is a saturation. Um, because of the, uh, this is one of the thinking mm -hmm. our is, it could be um, because of the, uh, we have the uh, two uh, two only um, backscattering in, uh, 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 like uh, layer from the Sentinel-1. So uh, we, we could only have one or two additional uh, layers. Those could be uh, used as a Sentinel-1 alone. So that is one of the reason is giving us saturation. So uh, th this is, we we haven't explored as uh, as like we we have explored the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Okay, thank you. So this this goes maybe to the, to the second question, which basically points out to that point by question by Muhammad Amjad Iqbal, that basically, uh, uh, he says that since Sentinel-2 uh, is optical, he may be geopartized by weather. And you said that basically you use synthetic aperture radar, Sentinel-1, for penetration. So he's basically asking if you try fully polarimetric data on that region to have better uh, sensitivity to the internal structure. So I guess part of the problem is to have data on that side. Right? But I, I would like to... to to hear your opinion about the use of fully polarimetric data to have more insights about the internal structure of the mangroves, as we do, for instance, in forests or in other regions. So please go, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Like, yes, uh, for full, full polarization, if we have the data, we, we can play. As we, as I mentioned previously, like we have the Sentinel uh, two, and we can calculate number of indices, number of parameters we can extract. And similarly, if we have the full polarized data, definitely uh, we we love to go for uh, the exploration and to do different experiment. But unfortunately, at the moment we don't have. Uh, we have the only the two uh, gen. So in this is the one of the um, limitation in our domain. So um, yes. Uh, obviously, um, that is again um, like we can think about, and like as we know, a biomass mission is coming out. Biomass mission yeah. is again a P band. P band is like a penetration power is much 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 higher than the uh, CL band. So that that is again the thing is we are looking to this. One. So uh, let me give you um, example like. And I want to discuss in a community and want to encourage all of you, whenever you collect, particularly uh, for the biomass or carbon stock data, please try to come out the results and those results try to communicate. Because when we communicate this result, obviously these are going to be validated for the global um, programs. And I'm, I'm, let me give you an example. Um, actually, I'm working on a Hindu Kush Himalaya region. This is one of the example in a, in a coastal area I showed you. But... Um, my, if you see a uh, career point of view, most of the time I spend in um, Nepal, Bhutan and other countries. So I actually collected a lot of field data. So I am in touch with the biomass mission uh, guys. So what they are, they are looking, they are looking always for the validation. First thing is to calibrate their sensor. So if the sensor is 
correctly calibrated. So definitely we will get the accurate result. So then we can actually validate our uh, finding. So again, I, I encourage you and I also promote this openness in terms of the, yes, uh, particularly field data point of view. If you have, then you can make a collaboration, particularly when you do work, please try to communicate um, in terms of not only the papers, figures, but in terms of the actual data, please try to disseminate our community. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I fully agree with you that, I mean, uh, biomass is going to be a game changer, but maybe it penetrates too much. So that's that's maybe, maybe the problem. So maybe the future NICER or the future Roselle, yeah, yes, sir. As far as I know, they may have uh, they may have a polarimetric capabilities in experimental mode. You have nowadays Southcom with the Argentinian system, which is fully polarimetric. I know it's a bit complex to get data, but this is something you you could try. So, uh, going to the next question, I mean, at the end of the presentation, you sh you show it that you wanted to. Uh, also estimate the height of the mangroves. And you were basically using Jedi, the Jedi mission, the LIDAR mission. So there is a question from uh, Omar Reshi uh, that that explain, that asks, how do you obtain this, this, uh, this forest, this forest, sorry, this mangrove height? So I guess it's from LIDAR, uh, as you explained. So just getting that, that question, do you, Planet, or do you experiment it to use a radar to estimate to estimate a height from from radar, or only you use the Jedi data? Um, let me uh, clarify here. When I showed you the entire methodology, again in that methodology, um, Jedi data is one uh, one of the parameters okay. which you actually use. But for along with that one, radar is actually used. So again, for radar, mm -hmm. um, the Sentinel one is uh, used. So in that sense, <laughs> actually, again, uh, integration fusion of the data um, actually I have used and came out with the results of the height but this is again a very um, challenging area and um, we are thinking to actually validate our findings and uh, we are trying to um, contact with the forest department where actually they can validate uh, our finding independently then we can we will try to go for a publication okay so now we go to the following question from Ellen Brock and uh, he she's uh, trying Um, Carlos, I think there was a small pause. Do you hear me? I think you were repeating the question from Ellen Brooke. Could you repeat that? Oh, yeah. So, so okay. uh, Ellen Brooke is asking if you could explain a bit how you compute the NDVI anomaly with the set of scores. Sorry, I did not get how I uh, calculated. The NDVI. Mm hmm with the, uh, with the NDVI anomaly okay. uh, with the Z-scores, Z-scores. Z-scores, okay, 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 okay. Okay, so actually, um, if uh, most of the time, um, if, if you have the data sets, uh, so what we do, we calculate the NDVI uh, for a certain um, period for one image to two image to three images. So um, what actually um, behind, uh, actually I did actually, um, uh, if you see from 1986 uh, till uh, 2020, for uh, annual composite um, calculated, um, mm -hmm. actually com uh, 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 composite prepare. So on the composite um, for a certain year calculated NDVI. So this is the one thing, simple um, formula is NIR minus that divided by NIR plus one. That is simple thing. So after computing that one, so we have the uh, Z score index uh, formula that is actually 
actual pixel value uh, minus divided uh, minus um, mean value and it divided by standard deviation root mean square. So that is a one of the formula used for the anomaly calculation. So it is um, if uh, you are interested, um, I will share my slides even and uh, under that one I can put the code so you can actually explore that code and that code is prepared in Google Earth Engine. It is very easy and straightforward. So actually you can see anomaly um, the behavior from normal behavior to abnormal behavior very easily it is um, a simple formula of c index okay so we have still time for a couple of more questions right yeah okay so let's uh, let's go uh, okay okay from ali uh, has uh, has name he, uh, he he's asking uh, uh, i'm reading the question uh, if you could explain uh, uh, why some google Earth engine data sets are not today so we can get the the latest data until 2023 of the peak canopy over the pakistan so he's asking basically if you if the if the um, tree or the canopy height uh, can be obtained up to date with google Earth engine um this is i actually i am not in a position to answer but um, okay. let me from the technical side what i can say mm, uh some of the data sets like we we have the raw data like even if we talk about most of the time in um around the globe land sets sentinel data are being used even the models is being used but um these uh even the jedi raw data is available um but for the uh, for the product development um like scientists um either sitting in nasa isa mm -hmm. or other agencies um uh, they need some time they need to uh, um, to consolidate the information, then accordingly develop and, and then disseminate. So that's why most of the time we don't get actually um, up to date um, this kind of tree height product um, uh, for um, just uh, right now we are seeking 2023. So we get this one. So if you explore like particularly uh, in terms of the mangroves or in terms of the uh, above ground biomass. So um, uh, these data sets are a couple of years back data set you will get. So, but uh, most important thing is you can follow the methodology, you can follow the procedure and you can have your own products locally developed. So that's why I, uh, if you see my, um, the first uh, couple of slides, what actually I did, and that was my motivation to come out our own product because that is again a locally acceptable yes global level if we 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 have some product that it it has its own objective it has its own um, some of the um, features that could be used for the global level studies and some uh, uh, quick assessment point of view but for locally if you want you have to understand the methodology and adopt and get your own result and that is will be more uh, credible okay Thank you. So we have another question from Live Lock that basically he would like to know if you could explain more uh, the type and the variety of the species which are included in the mangrove plantations. Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. <clears throat> um, if you go through literature, um, initially we um, we had number of species, mangrove species in Pakistan, around eight, uh, if I'm not wrong. But over the time period, um, due to some of the anthropogenic activities are and the climate change point of view. At the moment, if you see, we have max four species exist. So um, particularly for the plantation um, and the, in terms of the growth, looking to the local characteristics, soil characteristics, and the in terms of the water quality mm -hmm. point of view, um, most of the time, if you go and you will see Soria rubusta is, um, yeah, sorry, um, uh, Rhizophora is mainly uh, planted um, in uh, this area. So uh, this is the one of the uh, species in, um, in, in, in the Indus Delta. Uh, apart from that, we have uh, Rhizophora macronata is there one. So uh, th those species uh, exist that one. So um, uh, that is one of the challenge uh, in Pakistan in terms of the species. We we don't have the diverse mangrove species. 
So this is a second part of this question, which is I think is very interesting. Which uh, you have shown that the 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 size of the mangrove has exploded in the in, in the last year. So he he wants specifically to know which is the social impact of this increase on the mangrove uh, areas. Social impact huge. Uh, if you um go through um, a couple of videos, um, uh, just search uh, mangroves in Pakistan, uh, Indus Delta mangroves. So you will find actually um, the local communities are talking about this one. So um, uh, why they are talking? Um, historically, um, uh, they, they were degrading. Uh, they were not aware, like before 20, 2006, um, like mm -hmm. I am talking about. So, but right now, if you go and uh, they actually talk and they conserve, because of um, their dependency is completely on the uh, sea. They are going far um, uh, from their houses and um, moving in a creeks and collecting uh, fish, not only the fish and uh, prawns and some of the um, other seafood items. So and now with the increase of the mangroves, so their livelihood is increasing. So one mm -hmm. side is this, another side is these particularly nurse um are actually managed and um, are run by the uh, women so a uh, women actually are a uh, who, who actually uh, are talking about in terms of um, conservation. They actually participate very actively in uh, nurseries um, because of the very, very um, minimum amount, like you can say, um, in terms of the um, uh, selling those seeds. But actually these, um, uh, these nurseries actually selling some of the seed to the different um, donors and they, they are planting so this is one side another mm -hmm. side is they are um, having more fish and more sea, uh, sea items in terms of that so that is one thing and third is again most importantly they are well aware about the climate change mm -hmm. uh, because of they are seeing around the globe as we are living in an era of technology they can they they have observed different events of cyclones and they know about the about this this one could be um, the next they could be so then that way they again are well prepared so th these are the in terms of the societal and uh, one thing is very closely they are working with the uh, forest department you know, with the local different agencies so they 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 get actually um, acknowledgements so these are the some of the uh, societal side no no i think thank you very much for this answer because this is a nice way to close uh, i think the webinar how to show uh, how these restoration activities may improve the well-being of people but also how remote safety uh, technologies can contribute to that to that well-being. So, uh, Mohammed, here I think here we can already close this very nice presentation. We had a long a series of uh, Q and A session, which is uh, which is very nice. So, in the name of the React, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Jinani, for this nice presentation, for your time to to contribute to to this session. So. If there are no more other questions, so I think we can close here. I wish you uh, the best for the rest of the day. So uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. And for all of you who are interested, this presentation will be available in a few days in the YouTube channel of, GRSS, uh, of the GRSS. So thank you very much.